Welcome to Crime on Caffeine. I'm your host, Erica. And I'm your host, Allison. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode. Today, we'll be sipping on Coava Coffee. They were so kind and sent us three bags. So thank you so much to Coava. We got to choose which ones we got. So I'll be sipping on the Oh God, I hope I'm saying this right. It's called Ambessa. It's an Ethiopian blend, but the flavors are pomegranate, rosé, and dark chocolate. And of course, sad day. I've decided that I'm not going to be drinking peppermint mocha anymore. (laughs) Gasp. I know. It just doesn't feel right anymore, and I ran out. So I'd be sipping on it with some, what did we call it? Caramel? 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 I'm just going to make a decision here and say it's caramel. All right. It's caramel. I'll be sipping on caramel. See, it sounds weird to me when other people say it, but I know I say it. Caramel? Yeah. (laughs) And then the one I sent over to Erica was the Nayo Ovale. It's a Guatemalan, and its flavors are orange, almond butter, and milk chocolate. It was the almond butter that got me. That was the one that made me. I don't know. It's really good. I like it. I didn't like, I don't know. This was, you guys know me. I'm very plain. I'm very sweet. I drink my coffee like I'm 13, getting dropped off at the mall by my mom and my (laughs) friends, and we're going to get frappuccinos. That's how I drink my my coffee. So I was was a little nervous, but I feel like a big girl drinking this. You can order this online at coavacoffee.com, C-O-A-V-A. They have the cutest merch ever. They have a mug that I want so bad, but it's sold out, but it's so cute. It has like a mural painting on it, um, but all of their stuff is so cute. I know. I need a little shirt or something. I want the sticker. They have like a house, uh, a house, a heart sticker with like their logo and stuff on it. I want it for my laptop. Oh my god, you know which one I wanted for my laptop? The, like, splash sticker? So cute. I'm super into it. Oh, the, the, like, the, it's, like, ombre, I guess? It looks, like, very hippie-ish. Yeah, yeah. That was cute. But they also offer a coffee subscription. If you guys are interested, you can do bi-weekly or monthly. So that's awesome because it gets delivered straight to your door. So you don't have to worry about ordering all the time or going to the store or ever running out because it's just going to come right to you. Exactly. And I will mention it is whole bean. So I have a grinder luckily at my house and you know me, I'm, you know, just here for the people. So I ground it up for for me. (laughs) You're a real one for that. (laughs) And sent it to her all ground up already. I, I need to just get a coffee grinder. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'll send you the one that I like on Amazon. I think I'm going to get a new one. So you might okay. be able to just have my old one. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. I feel like whole bean is actually fresher. So Whole bean, because they put their whole heart into it. Whole bean, whole heart. Can't lose. <laughs> <laughs> we just wanted to give a shout out to all of our listeners in Slovenia for some reason, we are very high on the charts on Apple Podcasts there. We got some notifications this weekend, so thank you so much for listening to us. That's, like, really cool to see. Guys, first stop if we ever go on tour, we're going to Slovenia. Oh, yeah. We're just doing the whole tour there, just for it's you guys. Just, it will just be in Slo- <laughs> a week-long tour in Slovenia. <laughs> thank you guys so much for uh, i have no idea how you found us all of you apparently <laughs> i'm like the is entire- it a bad thing like are they saying like something bad <laughs> the entire population of sylvania listens to crime on caffeine at this point so <laughs> thank you um we will be moving there to start our careers <laughs> <laughs> very shortly <laughs> as full-time Slovenian podcasters. Um, But thank you guys. I am, I'm shook by that. That's so crazy. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you for almost 12,000 downloads. It's kind of crazy now how quickly this is moving. Um, Yes. Super exciting for us. So thank you guys so much for all of our new listeners. Welcome. 
If you guys have any true crime cases you want us to cover, go ahead, reach out to us on social media at Crime on Caffeine everywhere. You can head over to our website and submit um, a case down below or like off to the side, you can click it. You can email us, crimeandcaffeine at gmail.com, whatever way you want to get in contact. Give us some cases. Give us some of your favorite coffees to try. Just, you know, reach out. Say hi. Yeah, and we have gotten a few people DMing us just about, like, details in certain cases. Um, thank you, Megan, for who's from Arkansas, and she reached out to us on our Sam Little case. And remember how we were saying that Sam Little was always off? And he reported that he had murdered a girl in Benton or Bentonville, Arkansas. Well, yeah. thank God for her because she was like, listen, there is a difference. And they're like three hours away from each other. And they're like very oh. different areas. So, you know, that's really good information to know. So if we're ever doing a case that is a hometown for you or you're really familiar with the area, just reach out to us and like give us info. We love that. Yes. Thank you so much for giving us that information. I feel like looking at it as someone who lives in the area, it's so different. It is good to know any kind of information you guys have. If you are familiar with the case or you are from an area where there is a case, we would love to know. Also, we haven't talked about it in a really long time, but we still do have merch and we will have that linked on our Instagram and our website. And I'm just going to let you guys know. I wear that sweatshirt every day of my life. So do we. <laughs> and it is so cozy. And I sometimes get stopped and people are like, what is that? And I say, oh, nothing really crazy or anything. It's just my <laughs> podcast. Uh, it's called Crime on Caffeine. I don't know if you like true crime or not. You're too humble. You should be so proud. I'm like, don't listen, but listen. No, but like, you don't have to, but like, do. I'm excited for whatever this case is because I know nothing about it and I'm really not awake today. So, well, good we're, morning. We're gonna, good morning. We are going to be talking about Myra Hindley. Oh my God. I'm so excited. <laughs> what a case. I'm awake now. <laughs> I'm shocked you didn't get it when I said I was going to be going over a double serial killer. Okay, because there's so many duos. That's not the first duo I heard of. Oh my god, I can't wait to make fun of them. So, she was actually once considered the evilest woman in Britain. They said she was the personification of evil and ultimately pure evil. And he was considered the most hated man in Britain. Uh, they are famous for what they call the Moore's Murders. Born on July 23rd, 1942, Myra was brought up in Gorton, which was a working class area in Manchester, England. She's the daughter of Nellie and Bob Hindley. Her mother and father were both alcoholic and beat her regularly as a young child. The small house the family lived in was in a very poor condition, and Hindley and her parents had to sleep in the same bedroom. She was in a single bed next to her parents' double bed. Yikes. The family's living conditions deteriorated further after her sister was born in 1946. Shortly after the birth, she was sent to go live with her grandmother at the age of five. She grew up in a repressive, impoverished household, is the grandma nice? <laughs> Her grandma seemed to be nice. I mean, she was just, I think, messed up already. Her dad encouraged her to use violence to solve any conflict. So after the drowning of a close friend of hers at like the age of 15, she left school and then converted to Roman Catholicism. In 1961, when she was just 18 years old and working as a typist, she met a man named Ian Brady, who was working as a stock clerk at the same place. Despite learning that he had a criminal record for a string of burglaries and had literally just been released from prison, she became obsessed over him. We love when this happens. Happens to the best of us. Does it? Does it? I'm obsessed with my man. It's fine. <laughs> 
I'm obsessed with my man too, but he's a roofer, not a burglar. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit different. He does still have to go into people's homes. So I guess in a way. He could be a burglar. You don't know. <laughs> so Ian. Ian Brady was born in Glasgow as Ian Duncan Stewart on January 2nd, 1938 to Maggie Stewart, an unmarried 28-year-old tea room waitress. The identity of his father has never been uncovered, although his mother claimed that he was a reporter working for a Glasgow newspaper who died about three months before Ian was born. Maggie had little support and after a few months was forced to give up her son into the care of Mary and John Sloan. They were a local couple with four children of their own. Ian actually ended up taking their name and became known as Ian Sloan. His mother continued to visit him throughout his childhood. As a young child, he took pleasure in torturing animals. This is a big start. Red flag, red flag. He broke the hind legs of a dog. No, no, no. Which There's some things that I just don't need to know, and that is one of them. Yeah. When I read that, I said he can catch these hands because you don't mess with dogs. How, like, how is, that a, how is that a fun activity? I don't know, but the next two activities are even worse than that. Nobody um, had, he, like, a soccer ball or... No. So uh, he also set a dog on fire. <gasps> Mm-mm. Mm-mm. And he Mm-mm. decapitated a cat. Mm-mm. So on their first date, Ian took her to see a movie about the Nuremberg trials. He was fascinated by Nazis. Okay. He often read about Nazi criminals. And after the pair began dating, they read to each other from a book about Nazi atrocities on their lunch breaks. Yeah, I was going to say maybe reading would be a good hobby for him, but, like, maybe a different genre. I think it got worse. I think it made it worse. Yeah, yeah. Myra then altered her appearance to replicate the Aryan ideal, bleaching her hair blonde and wearing dark red lipstick. Oh, my God. It's She's honestly giving Cassie from Euphoria trying to get Nate's attention. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The pair then discuss committing crimes together, daydreaming about robberies that would make them rich. That evening, Brady told Myra that he wanted to commit his perfect murder. He told her to drive her van around the local area while he followed behind on his motorcycle. When he spotted a likely victim, he would flash his headlights and Myra would stop and offer the person a lift. Driving down Gorton Lane, Ian saw a young girl walking towards them and signaled Myra to stop, which she did not do until she passed the girl. So Ian drew up alongside her on his motorbike, demanding to know why she did not offer the girl a lift. And Myra said she recognized her as Mary Ruck, a nearby neighbor of her mother's. Ooh. Mm -hmm. So she was like, well, I'm not going to murder my neighbor. Shortly after 8 p.m., continuing down Foxmer Street, Brady spotted a girl wearing a pale blue coat and white high heel shoes walking away from them. And once again, he signaled for her to stop her van. Myra recognized the girl as Pauline Reed, a friend of her younger sister, Maureen. Okay, well, this isn't going to work if you know everyone. Reed got into the van with Myra, who then asked if she would mind helping to search for an expensive glove she had lost on Saddleworth Moor. Reed said she was in no great hurry and agreed. At 16, Pauline Reed was older than Mary Ruck, the girl that they previously stopped, and Myra realized that there would be less of a cry over the disappearance of a teenager than there would be about a girl who was seven or eight years old. So when the van reached the moor, Myra stopped and Ian arrived shortly after on his motorcycle. She introduced him to Reed as her boyfriend and that he had also come to help find the missing glove. Ian took Pauline onto the moor while Myra waited in the van. After about 30 minutes, Ian returned alone and took Myra to the spot where she was laying dying, her throat cut open. He told her to stay with Pauline. Well, he fetched a spade he had hidden nearby on a previous visit to the moor to bury the body. 
Myra noticed that Pauline's coat had been undone and her clothes were in a disarray. She had guessed that from the time it took him to kill her that he had also sexually assaulted her. Returning home from the moor in the van, they loaded the motorcycle into the back and then they passed Reed's mother, Joan, accompanied by her son, Paul, searching the streets for Pauline. Next, Myra approached 12-year-old John Gilbride on November 23, 1963, at a market in Ashton under Lynn, and asked him to help her carry some boxes. Ian was sitting in the back of a Ford Angula car that Myra had hired. When they reached a moor, Brady took the child with him while Henley waited in the car. Brady sexually assaulted Kilbride and attempted to slit his throat with a six-inch serrated blade before fatally strangling him with a piece of string, possibly a shoelace. Why the switch? I don't think Ian is a very organized killer, similar to somebody we've talked about in the past. Maybe it was BTK. It was BTK. Like when you get frazzled, you kind of change it up and you like forget your main goal here. I think it was one of those situations. Next was 12-year-old Keith Bennett. He vanished on his way to his grandmother's house in Longsight. During the early evening of June 16, 1964, four days after his birthday. Myra lured him into her mini pickup, which Ian was sitting in the back of, by asking for the boy's help in loading some boxes, after which she said she would drive him home. Next, Ian and Myra visited a fairground on December 26, 1964, in search of another victim, and noticed 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey standing beside one of the rides. When it became apparent that she was on her own, they approached her and deliberately dropped some of the shopping bags that they were carrying before asking her for her help carrying the packages to the car and then to their home. Oh my god, they're such assholes. (laughs) Once they were inside the house, Leslie was undressed, gagged, and forced to pose for photographs before being raped and fatally strangled with a piece of string. So this might be his new thing. Myra maintained that she went to draw a bath for the child and found the girl dead when she returned. The following morning, Ian Myra drove Leslie's body to Saddleworth Moor, where she was buried naked with her clothes at her feet in a shallow grave. On October 6th, 1965, Ian met a 17-year-old apprentice engineer named Edward Evans in Manchester Central Railway Station and invited him to his home at 16 Wardlebrook Avenue in Hattersley, where Ian beat him to death with an axe. 1965 is when it all ended when Ian and Myra moved into her grandmother's house together. The couple had become really close with David Smith, who is Myra's brother-in-law. One night, Smith came to the house on Brady's request to pick up some wine bottles. While waiting for Ian to deliver the wine... Smith overheard him beating the 17-year-old Edward Evans to death with an axe. Initially, he agreed to help him get rid of the body. When he got home, he told his wife, and they agreed to report the crime to police. So, Superintendent Bob Talbot of the Cheshire Police arrived at the back door of the 16 Wardlebrook Avenue house wearing a borrowed baker's overall to cover up his uniform. A little undercubby. Yeah, a little Auntie Covey moment. Talbot identified himself to Hinley as a police officer when she opened the door and told her that he wanted to speak to her boyfriend. She led him into the living room where Brady was writing a note to his employer explaining that he would not be able to get into work because his ankle was injured. The police officer explained that he was investigating an act of violence involving guns that was reported to have taken place the previous evening. Myra denied that there had been any violence and allowed police to look around the house. When they came to the upstairs room in which Evan's body had been stored, the police found the door locked and asked Ian for the key. Myra claimed that the key was at work, but after the police offered to drive her to the employers to retrieve the key, Ian told her to hand the key over. When they returned to the living room, the police told Brady that they had discovered a trussed-up body and that... He was being arrested on suspicion of murder. As Brady was getting dressed, he said, Eddie and I had a row and the situation got out of hand. 
Myra was not arrested with Brady, but she demanded to go with him to the police station, accompanied by her dog, Puppet, to which the police agreed. First of all, why do you have a dog if this man cannot be trusted with an animal? I don't understand that. He must not have told her. Myra was questioned about the evenings surrounding Evan's death, but she refused to make any statements beyond claiming that it had been an accident. As the police had no evidence that Myra was involved in Evan's murder, she was allowed to go home on the condition that she would return the next day for further questioning. Myra was at liberty for four days following Ian's arrest, during which time she went to her employer's premises. I like that they call them premises. Like, in America, we would never be like, oh, my employer's premises. <laughs> I'd be they like, do everything I'm a little like, fancy. They do everything with some do. spice over there. Add a little spice. Yeah, no. I'd just be like, I gotta go to the place that I work. My living room. <laughs> <laughs> in this case, yes. My living room. So she went to her employer's premises and asked to be fired, basically. Asked to be dismissed. So that she would be eligible for unemployment benefits. <laughs> and for what reason? While in the office where Ian worked, she found some papers belonging to him in an envelope that she claimed she did not open, which she burned in an ashtray. So why would you burn the envelope full of papers if you didn't open them and read what was inside of them? Sounds very incriminating, in my opinion. <laughs> Sounds real suspicious, in my opinion. She believed that they were plans for bank robberies, nothing to do with the murders. Nope, can't, can't be anything to do with the murders. They were just plans for bank robberies. Still shouldn't have burned them. <laughs> On October 11th, Myra was charged as an accessory to murder for Edward Evans. At first, they both maintained their innocence, but because they were acting on a tip from Maureen's husband, police found a suitcase in a railway station containing photographs and the audio recording documenting Leslie Downey's torture. Uh, Remember, they said that they had taken pictures of her. It's not looking good. It's not. It's not. It's looking really, really dim for them. Not the brightest crayons in the crayon box here. A search warrant for Myra's house also revealed a notebook with, quote, John Kilbride scribbled on the pages. Like, girl, you just gave that one away. That was, you. they just took that from you. (laughs) So now they know that not only is Edward Evans dead, they know that Leslie Downey is dead. And now they know that John Kilbride was also their victim. Police also found photos of the couple on Saddleworth Moor, which led them to search the area. Police discovered Downey's bodies there and subsequently charged Myra and Ian with three counts of murder. On April 27, 1966, they pleaded not guilty to the murders of Evans, Downey, and Kilbride. The trial lasted two weeks, but the jury only needed two hours to find both Ian and Myra guilty. And they received life sentences. Yes. We are here for it. We are here for their life sentences. Love it. Love a good life Kind of annoyed, though, because they had recently gotten rid of the um, death penalty over there. Oh, you don't say. Yeah, so they got life sentences. And so instead of it being like, and death on death penalty, it's just and death on life sentence. Yeah. But I don't know. I'm fine with that. Justice Fenton Atkinson, who presided over the case, called Brady, quote, wicked beyond belief, but did not believe the same to be true for Myra. He said that she would be changed, quote, once she was removed from Brady's influence. I believe they would say, well, as Taylor Swift once said, she was fucked in the head. Oh, yes. That was uh, clinical psychologist Taylor S. <laughs> Dr. Taylor, Dr. Taylor Swift. <laughs> Clinical psychologist Taylor D. Swift. Taylor D. Swift. Yeah, I don't know what her freaking middle name is. But I feel like every time I'm looking up... Is it? Yeah. (laughs) Every time I look up a psychologist or something, they always go by like their first and their middle initial and then their last name. Over 30 years later in 1998, Myra finally broke her silence about the abuse she claimed to have suffered by the hands of Ian. She said, 
People think that I'm the arch villain in this, the instigator, the perpetrator. I just want people to know what was going on, to help people understand how I got involved and why I stayed involved. I was under duress and abuse before the offenses, after and during them, and all the time I was with him. He used to threaten me and rape me, whip me, and cane me. He threatened to kill my family. He dominated me completely. She also claimed to feel great remorse after the killings at one point, quote, shaking and crying when she spotted a personal ad Pauline Reed's parents placed in search for her. Yikes, maybe you shouldn't have, like, cooperated in killing her. I don't know. That's what I'm saying. You had so much remorse for the first girl that he told you to stop and kill. You were like, no, I know her. But when he told you to stop and kill this one, you knew her too. You said that she was older and nobody would care as much. Like, that was you, girly. That was you. That was you, girly, not me. Nevertheless, Ian and Myra didn't confess to the murder of Reed or Bennett until 1985. Nearly two years later, Myra did accompany the police to the moor where she led them to Reed's body. However, Bennett's body has never been recovered and police don't have plans to resume their search. Kind of fucked, but nevertheless. Yeah, what? I mean, I guess it's something that she admitted that it was her and Ian that killed him, but that's all great and grand. What about his family? Wouldn't they want to know that there's a bot? Like, they're not going to be like, oh, cool. Yeah, just stop searching. I guess I guess they just killed him. It's cool. Right. They need some type of closure. On January 1st, 2000, it was announced that Myra was going to take her life imprisonment battle to the House of Lords. She had served more than 33 years in jail at this point. Ian, age 61 now, had gone on a three-month-long hunger strike, hoping to kill himself rather than die in prison. Despite her claims of being a victim, an earlier psychological assessment of Myra was released to England's National Archive following her death in 2002, and it revealed that some people felt that she was worse than her accomplice. Quote, I knew the difference between right and wrong. I didn't have a compulsion to kill. I was in charge. But in some ways, I was more culpable because I knew better. Yeah, that is frightening, ma'am. Yeah, for her to be like, oh, no, I was abused. Okay, well, stick to one. Like, were you, did you know better? Did you knew, know what you were doing? Or were you just under his spell and torture? So she's claiming that she was in charge. She knew better, whatever. She still always maintained that she never killed Leslie Downey. She said that she went up to run her a bath in that which she returned, and Brady had already killed her. We already talked about that. But in a book called Face to Face with Evil, Conversations with Ian Brady, he insists that it was actually Myra who killed her. So I don't know. I don't know who to believe. We're never going to get the truth out of these two. Which is so funny because if you're willing to, you know, tell the police, yes, we did this, like they confess to certain ones, but why lie about certain details? Like you already yeah, confessed. Like you're you're already screwed. You're already in prison for life. You think that being like, oh no, I just ran her a bath. They're, they're going to let you out? Because I don't think so. You spent your life in jail and you never received parole, even though you tried to get it like multiple times. T. Right. While in prison, however, Myra obtained an open university degree, started going back to church, and cut off contact with Ian. Good for her. She's, she said... <laughs> new year, she new said, me. <laughs> turning a new leaf. <laughs> As I said before, she never received parole. She did try to tell the courts, you know, I'm a better person now. I was brainwashed, even though we know that she also said in her psychological review that she knew what she was doing. Like, what? Who is believing you? She's Literally just trying no to, like, one. redeem herself, but she's making herself look crazier. She ended up dying of respiratory failure on November 16th, 2002, still in prison. Ian Brady passed away at the age of 79, it was reported that he passed away at Ashworth Hospital, which is a secure psychiatric unit, and that's where he had been detained since 1985. So, 
why was she not in a psychiatric unit? Like, I just feel like she... He tried to kill himself multiple times while he was in regular people jail. I think that is why he ended okay. up being transferred to a psychiatric unit. I'm okay. assuming because she didn't, you know, I was act like, this up. This chick belongs. Oh, she does for sure, but she wasn't she acted right while she was in prison. So they weren't like this girl needs to be transferred. So since we're talking about two serial killers in one, we can start with Ian Brady when it comes to psychology. According to Psychology Today, Brady is reported to have told the mental health tribunal that his killings were recreational. He enjoyed them and enjoyed perverting a young woman into becoming his accomplice. Whether or not the beginnings of psychosis played a part, his crimes are those of sadistic psychopath. Enjoying dominating others at the point of extinguishing them with little capacity to appreciate the feelings of others or experience guilt or remorse. It is said that Brady represented the darkest side of the national psych. He was unredeemed and unredeemable. Colleen Covington, the forensic psychologist and author of Everyday Evils, a psychoanalytic view of evil and mortality, said... It's much easier to think that Ian Brady was evil because he is then not someone like us. What's difficult is to identify with him in any way, to recognize that we may all at least have fantasies of torturing and killing, although most of us don't act on them. We project whatever is evil and sadistic onto the criminal so that we can remain unsullied and pure. I'm sorry. that I was just about to say. <laughs> uh, I did not like when he was speaking for everyone there. I didn't. I don't know about that. <laughs> so when I read that, I was like, I have to include this because me, what? We, you said we all. Who have is fantasies. who is we? Who is this we you're talking about? A collective we may all have fantasies of torturing and killing. I I. Oh, man, no. I'm going to sit this one out. I am going to have to just be, like, not even on the sideline. I'm not even in the stands. I didn't even go into the arena on that one. They did mention that he was claimed as a sadistic psychopath. People who have a sadistic personality tend to display recurrent aggression and cruel behavior. Obviously, this was very spot on. He was clearly very aggressive and cruel to all of his victims. And apparently he was very cruel and aggressive towards Myra as well. Sadism can also include the use of emotional cruelty, purposefully manipulating others through the use of fear and preoccupation with violence. So I wanted to bring that up as well because she mentioned that not only she mentioned, but other people mentioned that she would have never been this way if she wasn't with him So she said that he clearly manipulated her and was abusing her to get what he wanted out of her as his accomplice. And he mentioned that as well. Well, he was a psychopath, so I don't know what this bitch was expecting. A sadistic one. Now we can talk about Myra Henley. I think that Myra was a psychopath as well. Honestly, I really do. So I was going to just go over some psychopathic characteristics that appear to fit the profile of her. Social insensitivity, callous lack of empathy and emotionality, disregard for danger, troublesome behavior, dislike of others, conning, manipulation, failure to accept responsibility for your actions and attraction to the unusual. Knowing the victims would be slaughtered after Ian had finished with them, Myra didn't appear to give their fate a second chance or a second thought. Cohen and Strayer said, deficiencies in empathy have long been considered characteristics of persistently aggressive and antisocial individuals. Myra's role in assisting Ian to murder appears to have enabled him to be satisfied until it's time for another victim. An element of the control perspective is based on the idea that deviancy stems from a lack of self-control. She was prepared to do anything for Brady and was didn't really care about the cost, she found a life with him exciting. So there was a study on abused children that found that early childhood victimization has demonstrated long-term consequences for delinquency and violent behavior that was done by Dingwall. 
1996. Therefore, the abuse that she suffered as a child makes it far more likely that she would engage in violent behavior later on in life. Um, Displacement is a psychological defense mechanism in which negative feelings are transferred from the original source of the emotion to a less threatening person or object. This suggests that perhaps the anger she felt towards her father had been projected onto the victims, resulting in their brutal deaths. So I know that she wasn't the one whose idea it was to murder these people or murder these children. But I think that a lot of the things that she went through as a kid, you know, her father was a veteran of World War II. He also said things about Nazis. Then she meets him, uh, Ian, and he is this violent person too. And he thinks violence is the answer of anything. So her childhood mixed with Ian Brady, it was just bound to happen. It could have even happened without Ian Brady. Mm -hmm. She would have found someone else that was bad too. The last thing I wanted to go over is child murder psychology of child murder. Obviously, it's still a pretty rare crime. And I thought it was crazy because they said generally in the UK, there are between 20 to 40 homicides a year of the five to six million children ages zero to 14. So this study specifically was talking about the UK, which is where this happened. Of the five extrafamilial killers investigated in Pritchard and Sawyer's research, all were males aged 19 to 42 and had multiple past convictions, a.k.a. Ian Brady. One was termed a multi-criminal child sex abuser, while the other were claimed as violent multi-criminal child sex abusers. Pritchard and Sawyer argue this high level of previous criminality reflects chaotic backgrounds, of the five extrafamilial killers that they had researched for had some known previous contacts with their victim, but were not in any way family members, which I found interesting because Myra kept saying that she knew these people that they were going to stop, mm-hmm. but she wasn't family with them. She just knew them. And then lastly, Hyde, Brugard, and Myers describe a personality profile of a typical extrafamilial perpetrator is shy, anxious, reserved, experiencing feelings of inferiority, yes, taking refuge in fantasy where they become omnipotent and powerful, but the more they take flight into the imagination, the more real it becomes. This imaginary world gets so familiar, it's inevitably enacted. And that is what I've got for Myra and Ian, the Moore's murderers. Just something about killer couples. I've actually never done a killer couple. That was my first one. It's insane. Um, UK friends, let us know if you have anything, anything to say about that. Obviously, I knew this one, but I feel like I definitely am not as like familiar with cases outside of the U.S., so I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts. Yeah, I would too. I know that I didn't go over every single detail because there was a lot that went into oh, the yeah. more murders. I, there's so many details to this case. I feel like it would have had to have been like a four-parter. Literally. <laughs> so there are a few different things you can watch. I know that there are documentaries. There is something literally called The Moore's Murders on Amazon Prime. There's also See No Evil, which has a Moore's Murders episode. So oh if God, you so want to... Show. <laughs> right. The investigation discovery uh, shows are so good. Exactly. So if you do want to uh, continue your knowledge of Myra and Ian, which I don't. I'm done with them. <laughs> I've I've done the research. I've read the things. I don't need to know any more about these two idiots. Um, But yeah. And as Erica said, if you are not a U.S. listener, I want more cases that are not in the U.S. I've been trying to branch out of the U.S. more so that I can include our worldwide listeners. And this was just one of many. So Don't worry, though, you guys, because we got another serial killer coming at you next week. 
You're doing a serial killer? I sure am. Oh, I'm so excited about that. I sure am. And it was actually recommended by two people. So thank you very much. Yes, we will give them shouts out in the beginning of next week's episode so that you guys can get your credit. Give yes. credit where credit is due. Of course. And make sure you guys are following us on Spotify and subscribed on Apple Podcasts so you know when episodes come out and you can listen right away. Be the first to download that shit. Hell yeah. And if you haven't given us a rating on Spotify, go ahead and do that because that is a new feature that came out in the last couple of months. So I don't believe we have very many ratings. So we would really appreciate that. Thank you, guys. You know, we're we're doing big things out in Slovenia. We're trying to climb up these charts <laughs> in the U.S. So if you guys would just do that for us, that would be amazing. Yes, and we did um, start putting our episodes on YouTube slowly but surely. I had to get an external hard drive because my computer is running out of room. So I'm sorry <laughs> that they're not they're not on all they're not all on there yet, but they will be. So if that is your preferred method of podcasting, then head on over to YouTube. Everything that we do is literally just crime on caffeine. So. Thank you guys so much for listening, and we will catch you on next week's episode.